you as a doctor give hope and health to many each day there are many more to give hope and health to and with fuji film we are doing that together thank you everybody and uh, so we are going to veer a bit away from imaging to tumor biology and a brief outline of my talk is as follows i will give you a brief primer into understanding breast cancer biology and uh, just just a little bit about what the breast imager needs to know of course i'm going beyond my brief and my knowledge here is what i ga have gained from my pathologists and uh, friends and friends at molecular biology we will see how breast imaging is linked to tumor biology what is the practical implication of these associations and how this has led to an uh, the developing interest in radio genomics and the quest for imaging biomarkers that can meaningfully impact patient care so at the heart of the problem the conundrum we face is that breast cancer is a heterogeneous disease and so the presentation is varied it depends upon the age the environment the lifestyle and the treatment responses are varied from one individual to the to the next and prognosis too is varied we are all familiar with the tnm staging which we have used since decades for staging uh, the tumor and for guiding our treatment from our pathologist friends we also get information about the histological grade for which they use a grading scheme called the bloom richardson nottingham scheme where they look at three features of the tumor they being tubule formation nuclear pleomorphism and mitotic activity each of these are assigned uh points uh, the lower the tubule formation more the pleomorphism more the mitotic activity more aggressive the tumor is higher the points are assigned these points are summed up to reach a score and accordingly the tumor is graded from 1 to 3 So let us look at a clinical scenario. You have three patients here: Lena, Mina, and Nina. All of them have T two N zero M zero disease. That is tumor size somewhere between two to three centimeters. So they are what we call early stage invasive breast cancer. So here is a poll question: What sorry? What would be the standard treatment protocol for these patients? Would it would we do imaging? followed by biopsy conservative breast surgery chemotherapy or radiotherapy and our uh, our choices are true or false is the poll on yes do we have the answers so uh, a uh, majority majority of you think that this is going to be the uniform treatment that we can offer to all these patients but what we have learned from our, our experiences is that we cannot use this one size fits all approach traditional broad based chemotherapy is less effective in treating all our patients and sometimes we have offsite uh, target side effects which are um, uh, often more detrimental to the patient than the disease itself some patients will do well some patients will recur uh, in say even less than 2 years and that is, that is what takes us to precision medicine where we tailor the treatment according to the genetic a makeup of the tumor and the tumor environment and this personalized treatment will dictate our treatment choices how we screen these patients and the prognosis of this of these patients so coming back to our clinical scenario here we have lena who has a uh, an aggressive what we call her to enrich tumor and she will not receive surgery up front she will undergo neoadjuvant chemotherapy even though her disease is early stage and we have good 
targeted therapy available for her in the form of anti her two monoclonal antibodies and uh, we see that she responds very well to this treatment she after completion of her chemo chemotherapy she undergoes surgery and the final histopath report says that there is a pathological complete response and that she has no residual tumor so what started out as an aggressive disease we end up with a very good extremely good prognosis for this lady meena on the other hand has a low grade hormone sensitive tumor she will undergo surgery first and uh, we have ways of telling that she does not need chemotherapy uh, following her surgery and all that she needs is oral medication with anti estrogen drugs like um, tamoxifen or uh, uh, selective estrogen receptor modulators and finally nina here has what we call a triple negative high grade breast tumor she has a positive family history of breast cancer in her mother and ovarian cancer in a maternal aunt she's advised genetic counseling it turns out that she has a brca1 gene mutation and she's advised risk reduction strategies in the form of bilateral mastectomies and oophorectomy so what is it that causes these tumors in these three different patients to behave in a different manner it is because of the genetic makeup of the cell the information of which is carried within the dna the dna by a process of transcription gives you the mr uh, produces the mrna which carries the blueprint for the expression of specific proteins and these proteins in turn uh, lead to triggering of metabolic pathways that lead to sustained cell proliferation that can allow, make the tumor evade growth suppressors activate invasion induce angiogenesis and resist cell death it was in the year 2000 that a significant development happened and that was the development of multi gene panel assays which we are now quite familiar with thanks to covid and also known as next generation sequencing and with uh, and it was in the year 2000 that peru et al published this paper on the molecular portrait of breast cancer where they did multi gene sequence assays on 78 uh, breast tumors and they could identify hundreds of genes that were associated with cancers in these patients and they found that they could broadly classify these cancers into four molecular subtypes they were the luminal a the luminal b the her2 enriched and the basal like tumors now to understand this we need to go back to the basic functioning unit of the breast parenchyma which is the terminal ductal lobular unit the acinus which is the milk produce producing unit of the breast and this is lined by a two cell layer the inner layer is the luminal cell which lines the lumen uh, outer basal myoepithelial uh, layer now this luminal cell is responsible for milk production it uh, is er sensitive and it has estrogen receptors on its surface cancers that originate from these luminal cells are what we call as the luminal cancers and because they arise from the luminal cell they will recapitulate the gene profile of the luminal cells that is ck8 and 18 and also express estrogen progesterone and hormone activity genes they can be further classified into luminal a which has higher er expression less proliferative and a very favorable response and luminal b which has less er expression more proliferative and slightly more aggressive so as we said these cancers have estrogen and progesterone on their cell surface so when the estrogen attaches itself to these receptor sites they will change the gene expression activity which leads to expression of proteins that trigger metabolic pathways that cause uncontrolled cell proliferation now we can use this information to treat these cancers so with the help of anti estrogen drugs like uh, 
tamoxifen or aromatase inhibitors. They will compete with the estrogen for these receptor sites. They will block, block the activity of the estrogen. And as a result, the cells will stop growing. The second group of tumors that we uh, are the HER2 enriched tumors. These are more aggressive and have a high proliferation. Fortunately, they are less common, about 10 to 15 percent of all breast cancers. What is peculiar to them is the overexpression of the HER2 receptor uh, protein, that is the human epitomial growth factor, which in turn leads to sustained signaling of the nucleus to undergo cell proliferation. And finally, we have have the basal cells, which we say, said arise from these basal myoepithelial cell. Again, they will show the uh, high. They will show a high expression of the basal uh, uh, genes, that is CK5, 14, 17, and high proliferation genes. They are more aggressive, and they have a poorer prognosis. Now, uh, genetic assays are not easily available. And so we have surrogate markers in the form of special stains that we use at immunohistochemistry and fluorescent in situ hybridization. So a luminal A cancer will stain positively for the estrogen and progesterone receptors, but not for the HER2 receptor. A luminal B will stain less intensely for estrogen progesterone and may or may not stain for HER2 receptor. The HER2 to enrich will not stain for the uh, estrogen progesterone receptors, but strong, stain strongly for the HER2 receptors. And finally, the basal cell will not stain for any of these uh, receptors. And these are what we call the triple negative cancers. Now, the HER2 status report comes as reads as 0 to 3, where 0 and 1 is considered negative, 2 is equivocal, and 3 is strongly positive. So if it is equivocal, we, need, we do another test which is the fluorescent inside the fish test and her to enrich tumors will take up this fluorescent uh, stain. We also have a marker for cell proliferation, which is called the key 67. A higher key 67 uh, score indicates a more aggressive tumor. And we use this, this to differentiate luminal A from luminal B. So with a cutoff value of around 15 to 20%. So uh, hormone positive tumors showing this high score are classified as mm -hmm. luminal B. <laughs> Now, we are aware that it is our genetic makeup that determines our facial features, the uh, skin uh, color, tone, and uh, hair texture, etc. Similarly, it is the tumor genotype that will determine its imaging phenotype. So here you have a 66-year-old lady who's come for a routine screening. We see this uh, small irregular mass here. We can see speculations that are also beautifully seen on these DBT images. And um, this is the ultrasound where we see a taller than wild, again, uh, lesion with uh, the speculations are well seen. There is distal acoustic shadowing. So here is a poll question. What do you think, which cancer uh, molecular subtype do you think this cancer is? Luminal A, B, luminal B, HER2 enriched, or the basal type? Can we have the poll, please? Luminal A, B, HER2 enriched, or the basal cell? Excellent. So most of you think this is the luminal A, and that was right. These are slow-growing indolent tumors. Uh, this um, at, sorry. So at biopsy, this was a low-grade tumor, strongly ER positive with a K67 score of 10%. And uh, this is how luminal cancers present. They are very slow indolent tumors. And uh, uh, because of their slow growth, they may, if you had a mammogram that was uh, of this lady, say from one or two years ago, maybe the lesion was there and it was overlooked by the by, on the mammogram because they do grow very slowly. And because of their indolent growth pattern, they incite a host reaction, which leads to this desmoplastic reaction causing these speculations and this dense acoustic shadowing. 
Now, here you have a 36-year-old lady who is presented with a left breast lump. You can see the asymmetric density in her left breast. On the DBT, DBT images, we see this irregular mass here. And uh, she also had uh, pleomorphic microcalcification in a segmental distribution. On the ultrasound, there is a microlobulated lesion with parallel orientation. The disease was multifocal, and there was also an abnormal uh, enlargement um, uh, axillary node. Again, can we guess on the uh, molecular subtype, luminal A, B, HER2 enriched, or the basal uh, subtype? Do, the, do we have the answers, Mitusha? So most of you thought this was a luminal B. Uh, so let's get back to this case. Um, so what we see here is uh, at biopsy, this was a hormone negative and a HER2 enriched tumor. And that is how often HER2 enriched tumors present. They present with calcification. They are, you often have multifocal disease. They often are large tumors and often uh, and also may have axillary nodes at presentation. Again, we, ha we have targeted therapy available for her. So she was given neoadjuvant chemotherapy with trastuzumab along with um, along with the regular chemotherapy drug drugs. And we see that uh, we follow these patients during uh, their NACT. We see that there is uh, excellent resolution of her tumor, which is now no longer we are able to discern it on the DBT images. The calcification see, appeared to have reduced in number, though they persist. So we did a wire localization and bracketing of these calcifications for the uh, surgeon uh, to guide guide them for the surgery. Here's a specimen radiograph uh, showing, uh, uh, showing the calcifications and uh, uh, in the specimen. And at final histopath, there was no residual tumor, no DCIS, and no disease in the nodes. So what she had achieved was, again, a pathological complete response. Here is a 33-year-old lady who presents with a circumscribed lump in her upper outer quadrant. Here is her DBT and her ultrasound image, extremely circumscribed, very hypoechoic, almost cystic appearing mass. What do, you, what do you think this tumor was? Here is our poll question again. Is this a complicated cyst? Is this a fibroadenoma? Is it an IDC or is it metastasis? Excellent. So most of you thought this was an IDC. Indeed, it was. And at biopsy, this was, uh, sorry, I didn't show you the this um, image that showed that this lesion was very vascular. It's not a cystic mass. And at biopsy, this was a high-grade IDC uh, uh, and a triple negative breast cancer. Now, uh, the problem is that there is a variable agreement between these surrogate markers and the formal gene testing, and the agreement can be as low as 41%. And most genetic defects will not have surrogate markers identified. And therefore, there will be some imprecision to our diagnosis if we are to rely entirely on this surrogate markers, which will lead to underdiagnosis of lethal cancers, overdiagnosis, and overtreatment of indolent cancers. And therefore, uh, gene expression profile assays will help us in resolving this issue. At the moment, they are available only for ER positive tumors. The commercial ones that are now available are the Oncotype DX, the Mammoprint, the PAM50. All of them look at different number of genes by different methods. And what they're basically looking at is for ER positivity and the proliferation genes. The 
what they tell you is about the risk of recurrence and the risk of metastases and the treatment decision that we can take from these tests is whether the patient needs adjuvant chemotherapy or radiation so let's look at two such assays the oncotype dx which evaluates the tumor for 21 genes and what it tells us is about the risk of ipsilateral breast cancer in within 10 years for this lady and if the score is low that is below 11 then we uh, she has very small uh, she has abs she has no risk of developing ipsilateral breast cancer and the treatment choice that we can make is that we can avoid chemotherapy in this lady and she need only to be put on endocrine or anti hormone therapy in fact, chemotherapy will only cause her harm because it's not going to do any good for her uh, tumor as such. On the other hand, MAMA print here uh, also is analyzes about 70 genes. What it tells you is about the risk of net metastases in five years. And again, if the score is low, we can make this uh, choice of avoiding chemotherapy. Now, the impact from these myo biomarkers have been so significant and uh, um, in the patient treatment and prognosis that they are now been included in the eighth ed edition of the AJCC tumor staging known as the prognostic staging. So if you have a T2N0M0 tumor, according to the seventh edition of the AJCC, which was an anatomic TNM staging, this tumor would have been classified as 2A. But with an oncotype DX score of 11, we can now downgrade this tumor to to one A. Now, the limitations of these gene assays is the high turnaround time. It takes about a couple of months for the results to be available. They are often only available at off-site or offshore labs. And the cost of this um, uh, tests are also high, running into a few thousands. And therefore, there is a strong demand to, de uh, to develop other alternatives like imaging biomarkers and surrogates. We have just seen how how the biomedical images are a product of the processes that occur at the genetic and the molecular level. And this has led to this uh, um, uh, recent and uh, extreme interest in these two fields of radiology, that is radiomics and radiogenomics. What is radio, uh, radiomics? Uh, it, uh, it, has, it has evolved because of the uh, in, immense progress that we have made in data analytics, artificial in intelligence and machine learning what uh, what we what the what we can now do is extract a large amount of qualitative and quantitative features from a large volume of digital images and amalgamate it with the patient clinical data now what can what are these features that we extract it could be the birads morphological features various aspects of the uh, tumor kinetics and all and uh, things like technology texture analysis of the tumor and um, this is done by uh, various uh, processes like histogram analysis, ROI identification, segmentation, etc. So the, when the information from radiomics is combined with the genetic da data, that is what we call as radiogenomics. Now, radiogenomics is a system biology approach. So from the tumor sample, we can get information about the genes. There are also now assays available to uh, get information about the mRNA transcripts, the proteins and the metabolites. And then there is all this information that we can get from the images. Now, the advantages of imaging is that you're looking at the tumor as a whole, while in tumor sampling, we're only seeing a small portion of the tumor. So we only have a snapshot of the whole picture. And uh, intratumoral heterogeneity is also known, by which we mean part of the tumor may be hormone uh, sensitive and part of it may be HER2 enriched. And your, your result will depend on from where you're sampling this tumor. So all this information is integrated by computational um, 
analysis and mathematics and uh, the computer can build a model it can build uh, it can generate computer algorithms hypotheses can be generated which can be tested and validated which leads to more precise diagnosis prediction and prognosis all this uh, information is available as an open source in centralized repositories like the cancer imaging archives and the cancer genomic atlas so let's see some applications. Yamamoto et al. In, uh, as early as 2012, they studied 10 patients. They looked at 21 qualitative imaging features of MR and they could correlate with over 71% of the 52,000 genes that they studied. The same group also developed algorithm that could detect tumor enhancing heterogeneity that linked to immune related genes that we see in interferon rich uh, triple negative breast cancer. Now, these are the cancers that would escape the normal line of chemotherapy. And if so, if we have this information available to us prior, we can, uh, we can start targeted therapy or specific therapy in these individuals uh, uh, earlier. And this has great significance for the patient prognosis. This is a more recent, recent paper by Zhu et al. in 2020, where uh, they could create computer models by uh, wavelet texture analysis, where they could differentiate uh, uh, and predict tumors that could achieve PCR and differentiate it from, the, uh, from tumors that would not achieve PCR. Researchers have also been able to find imaging features linking them to molecular subtypes. For example, homogeneous tumor enhancement has a 100% negative predictive value for luminal B cancers. Or if you look at the initial uh, rapid phase enhancement, HER2 enriched tumors will have a steeper slope of enhancement as compared to other tumors. Where all their researchers have also found imaging correlates that link with the oncotype DX and help in predicting risk of recurrence. So in conclusion, radiogenomics is a promising field with potential to capitalize on the rapid growth in data analytics and the deep wellspring of breast cancer genetic knowledge. The limitations, however, is that uh, the, the images that are used are vastly that, uh, that we obtain from the MRI. So there is a selection bias. There is a positive of the genetic information. For example, 